Hello and welcome to this week's look at film and television action on our YouTube channel. Um, now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been perusing the world of certain action sequences, whether that be something that's referred to as relatively simple as falling downstairs, um, to turning cars over. Well, this week is high falls. For me, one of those really exciting things. You know, you see it, and what's also exciting is that I know whether there's a written rule in action cinematography, but certainly from an editor's perspective, a high fall always looks better if it's filmed in slow motion and then covered by whoa, two or three cameras. So you get that initial fall, then you can cut at it from various angles and it makes it look further, it makes it look more elegant. It's an art form, after all. And on the strength of that, um, that's why we're going to have a look at some of these high falls. I've had some experience of this, um, because, as many of you will know, I've talked about it before, uh, Royal On was very good in uh, giving me opportunities to learn from him um, when I first said that this was something that I wanted to do the stunt business was something that I could see myself doing um, we did horse riding not terribly successfully admittedly but we did horse riding and um, that was towards the end and uh, we also did some falls now Roy had got himself uh, a bit of a reputation as a high fall man and only really because he wanted to have a go. You know, it wasn't really down to the fact that he particularly excelled at it. I think, as with um, with anybody at first, if you don't do it, you know, you're not too fussed about it, you go, well, I'll have a go. And obviously that was the case. So one of his earliest falls, he'd been doing little bits and pieces um, throughout the sort of, I would say, early to mid 70s um, with Les Dawson comedian Les Dawson on a television series called Says Les S-E-Z-L-E-S Says Les and there were some sketches uh, Les was obviously the brunt of a great many of these jokes he was the comedian so he would set bits and pieces up and Roy was his fall guy they got on very well together and ultimately, um, he did a great many bits of work on the television show. Um, there was a sequence, for instance, uh, where a man, uh, Les Dawson, in his uh, bowler hat and a sharp suit with an umbrella, is uh, leaving a taxi cab and comes out of the car and walks up some steps where a man, Roy, is coming down with a tray of cakes. You can automatically see where this is going, right? And as they pass each other on the steps, not many steps, probably six or seven, um, Les sticks the stick out and manages to trip up Roy, who dives from the top step... Ste not, um, that's not easy to say, is it? Off the top step. Off the top step. There we are, I knew I'd get it in the end. Three-take Johnny, they call me. Um, and landing on the floor with cakes everywhere. Now, um, the camera then, the, and the, the, the payoff, the gag, is the camera panning over to a sign that says Office for Accident Prevention. Ta-da! Big laugh. Well, that sort of stuff was a regular thing. Sketches, skits, bits of business. And Roy would be a window cleaner, a traffic warden, a mechanic. You know, whatever it took, he would turn up. So leading up to... Um, getting a job with um, uh, Vic Armstrong. Vic had asked him to go out and be part of his team for Green Ice um, in 1981. And the reason that had happened is because they had worked together before on Escape to Athena, um, where he falls through the roof of a Turkish bath. More or less the furthest he had fallen 
and this is what 50 60 feet i think but it's the way he has to do it and i learned from him that when you jump from 20 feet jumping from 20 feet into boxes and, and mats as we were doing then is very very different than jumping from 50 or 60 feet into an airbag because you're firstly oh, the, the obvious thing is that the hang time in the air is longer and what happens in the air is that your body this is again a psychological thing but your body inspired by your brain your brain is saying make sure you know where the bag is make sure you know you're going to you hit the middle you've got to be at, right just keep watching the whole time before you hit the middle but what happens is that when you look down your body position tends to move um steve wyman a good example and um he will crop up in a little montage that we have coming up but Steve Wyman was doing a motorcycle gag one day on Stuntman 86 and had to hit the wheel arch of a parked car with his motorcycle and leave the handlebars and go through the window of a shop, a patisserie. There's a cake theme going on here. Roy with his cakes earlier. Uh, Steve going through the window of a cake shop. Now... As Greg Powell, the stunt coordinator, said later, Steve's obviously very conscious about hitting his mark, which you have to do. You've got to hit that mark and hit it properly. And that bike's got to stick in that car. It can't just bounce off and come up through the window because that's that's a whole different ball game. That's very dangerous. You don't want to start doing that. No, no, no. So he's trying to spot the point where he has to make the impact. And because he's doing this, when that impact happens, he tends to follow the line of where his eyesight is. And consequently, if you see the footage, which I urge you to do, Stuntman86 is on the channel, go and check it out. You will see that his body flops forwards instead of going straight, which is ultimately what he was planning on doing, because he's trying to look at where he's going. His eyesight, his eye level dropped, his body then flopped, and he nearly nearly missed the window put his hands on the bottom sill and flipped through it broke the window jobs are good and looked fantastic ultimately he'd want to go through straight through the, the thing like that now doing that from a falling point of view you are doing a similar exercise you are step for and another thing to take consideration is is perspective looking at it from the bottom and looking at it from the top you stand down there at the bottom looking up and you go that's okay I can do that. What's that? 30 feet? 30 feet? No problem. No problem. Easy. You get up there looking down, and that's when everything is different. The whole world falls away from you, and suddenly a 30-foot fall, and you've got this in your head. That's 30 feet. But this is way bigger than you'd anticipated. So, you're standing on the edge, and you're looking down. Now, what I was doing with... Um, with Roy were duo falls originally I would fall with him and we would do what's known as a, um, a seat drop or a saddle fall saddle drop seat drop you're landing flat there's no you're not flipping over onto your back you are landing in this position and you are landing flat but your your body your b bottom first that's the way you're falling and so you try and take a take a glance of where you need to be so you can keep looking straight to then maybe check it at the last point as you come down i was going with roy at the time when i did one on my own we built up from from 30 40 50 to 60 feet when i went on my own it was a big difference a big di i remember saying to him afterwards you're in the air for so long and your body will move the higher you get the wind will adjust. You'll get heavier gusts coming right to left, straight on at you, from behind you, whatever the deal is. So there's all these factors to be taken into consideration, and your body position is crucial to you landing safely, hitting the mark, 
hitting the airbag square on. And if you don't, that landing in the airbag is one thing. Landing safely in the airbag is another thing, because unless you disperse that weight by putting your hands right out next to you as you land flat as flat can be, you have to disperse that weight. If you hit that knees first, feet first, firstly, there's injuries that will be caused to you because your body's not meant for that type of thing. I spoke to somebody, uh, in fact, my cousin, here we are. Here's the thing. My cousin was on um, a, uh, a, Katie, if you're watching, I hope you're um, I hope you're on the mend and that everything is going very well. I, I'm just going to briefly explain because there's a very good example. Uh, she was on an activity thing. I believe it was a work thing, an activity thing. And there was... Um, uh, what's it called it's it's like um it's like um uh, like bouncy castles and you have the inflatables that was the word i was looking for thank you inflatables right and you were jumping from one to the other to get from here to over there well landing he, she jumped from one to the other and ultimately the one in the middle wasn't an inflatable it was a bouncy castle which is a very different thing because it's built slightly differently and the air capacity contained within is not dispersed in the same way because it's supposed to be rooted to the spot when you hit some of these inflatables they've got give in them they allow for a bit more give uh, nine times out of ten it's normally um, small children they come sliding down they roll over they fall over they get back up they're happy as larry because their size coupled with the amount of air that's in the whole thing and the, the way in which that it's being used they're bouncing on it they're jumping on it it takes it takes the disbursement out of that but obviously what had happened was that she jumped down onto this thing i assume expecting it to propel her forwards and it just didn't all it did was throw her to one side because the the it, the way it's been inflated meant that it was much much heavier as a landing area than possible it gave a bit of give and then chucked her off to one side and really injured her uh, her hip uh, and her um, her ankle i believe so these things you know they are sent to test you and you can't just land in the middle of it and hope for the best landing in it is one thing but you have to land correctly in it that's the most important thing um, and we will see some footage very shortly in connection with that so all of these things take into consideration the boxes the padding that you would land into firstly then when the falls got a bit bigger roy used to say himself um that um you know cardboard boxes cost 85 pence a piece or well, they used to when when he was buying them and uh, when you land into a landing area which is cardboard boxes and is ma uh, padding mattresses you have to replace the damaged cardboard boxes and I say you know 85 pence ago well that can be quite expensive if you're having to do a very large area so consequently he looked at working uh, with um, with the airbag and the airbag of course had been ar arranged originally I believe for the fire service and then and then of course the um, airlines had taken it on as a uh, an easy escape path, safety escape system so it works very well it's not like the Olympic ones Often people say, "Oh, it's a." You see the Olympic pole vaulters. Well, that's a very that's a that's a static structure, that's going nowhere. It's it's padding, it's foam based, and um, you know they are falling from meters high, but they're not travelling at the same speed as you would be when you hit the bag. You do a hundred foot fall and you weigh, well, I don't know, nine, ten stone. If you do the trigonometry and the feet per second per second, by the time you hit that, you could weigh anything up to 30 stone. <laughs> it makes you think for a moment, doesn't it? So on the strength of that, when you hit that surface, you have to disperse that weight. And um, stunt people have been doing that for many, many years very successfully. There have been occasions when it has not gone well. Um, um, a stuntman that we will see in uh, some clips, but uh, AJ Bakunas um, did a very high fall over 300 feet from a building in Lexington, Kentucky, I want to say, um, for the movie Steel in 1978, 78, 79. And 
when he'd already done the fall. Uh, this was this was the second fall, so he had already done it from a certain height, and that particular piece of footage had been captured and used in the film. He then went ahead to do it again because his good friend and uh, stuntman Dar Robinson had uh, uh, was currently holding the world record for high falls, and the two of them liked a little bit of competition and decided, well, I'll have a go at going higher. World record, I think, was 310. And, uh, well, he decided he was going to go, I don't know, 324, 3 something like that, 3, three whatever it was. It was very high. And uh, so had already done the fall. That's done. That's captured on film. Did it again the second time. And uh, obviously I don't know how, how many times this airbag had been used or how many occasions... Or what sort of um, beating it had taken over time. And obviously they're safety tested to a point. But um, there was a seam which separated. And uh, he w hit the airbag, went through the airbag and landed on the floor. Um, managed to hang on until the following morning where he was pronounced dead. And that really does, you know put you in put the whole thing into some sort of perspective yes they are falling from height yes they are doing it instead of the actor because the actor doesn't need to do it and yes they are you know they're taking precautions they have mats they have pads they have boxes or in these instances they have um, airbags but it's not a fail safe situation so on the strength of that let us take a look at some of the falls and uh, we'll talk you through it here it comes so here is Dar Robinson uh, it's effectively a base jump but uh, he wasn't afraid to jump off anything at all here on the other hand is uh, Butch and Sundance this is Mickey Gilbert and Howard Curtis and it's a painting there's no cliffs there at all they're jumping from a cherry picker um, that's how it started it was on the back lot and there was a lake nearby which they had gone to. It was a man-made lake, as, as I remember. And the initial jump you see is of the two actors. And they're jumping, I don't know, five, six feet. Then there's a cut to the two guys jumping from a cherry picker crane into the water. And the cliffs are matte paintings. Here is Grant Page in Australia, on fire, falling backwards into water. Now look, he's positioned his hands in such a way because he knows it's coming. And he's having to judge when. And he wants his hands to be the first thing to hit the water before his legs come right over his head. <gasps> wow. This is Swashbuckler from 1976. Joffrey Brown, Howard Curtis and Chuck Waters are the three stunt performers leaping from the carriage as it goes over the edge of an 85 foot cliff um, the major concern here is getting away from the carriage and trying to be as far enough away from it as possible when it hits the water you don't want to be landing on top of it you don't want it to be landing on top of you and uh, look at that Joffrey going in diving in only just making it too. Extraordinary stuff. That might give you a better idea of the type of height we're looking at. Here's Martin Grace from Escape to Athena. This, I'm, well, this is an episode of The Fall Guy. I'm assuming uh, that that's Mickey Gilbert, although um, I know he was Lee Major's double on a lot of the series. A.J. Bakunas from the movie Hooper. And again, his positioning here is very interesting because he it's a swan dive. And look at the way his legs come over the top of his head. Now, he's still looking down. He's still looking to see where he's going to. And that's 247 feet. Boom, straight into the big airbag. That's him again from the movie The Stuntman, similar positioning. Here, Tony Smart doing the first part of a high fall and Vic Armstrong doing the rest in the movie The Omen 3. 
Dar Robinson in Sharky's machine doubling Henry Silver. Coming out of the window backwards, not being able to see his airbag. He's got a mask on. And because of the rotation that now takes place, he's landing sideways into his bag. This is Jeff uh, Jerry Hewitt uh, from the movie uh, Soldier. And timing crucial here. Got to go then. The special effects set the bang off. Buddy Joe Hooker doubling Sylvester Stallone in the movie First Blood. Separate shots then of him falling through the trees. And from the same film, this is stuntman Bobby Sargent falling from a helicopter into an airbag below. Again, positioning is everything. This is Roy Alon. Take a look at his positioning in the air. Look, rotating his arms, rotating his arms, then tucking to get for the landing at the end. Steve Wyman with a tricky one in Death Wish 3 coming out and then having to spot the landing whilst turning at the same time. His legs are coming up. He um, doesn't want those to come over his head. Tip-tipping, going backwards over a wall. And then in the same shot, they then use a dummy for this sequence. It's very odd. This is uh, well, the actor William Peterson. Now, the movie is To Live and Die in L.A. The stuntman is Dar Robinson, and he is testing and using his decelerator. Look at his uh, right leg. It stays almost stationary. His left leg is doing a lot of the positioning, and when the tension kicks in, there. And that is what he then used on a number of different pictures. This is another good example of stick falling backwards, firing all six shots, 200 feet with no airbag, just that wire, there it kicks in now, and then a dummy for the final shot. Absolutely extraordinary moment. Uh, more high falls this time. Dar again on the uh, in the dark jacket. On the, this side is uh, Mick Rogers. This is Lethal Weapon. And they're doing the high part of the fall into an airbag. Making it look easy. It's not easy. When you get up there changes positioning when you're when you're on fire of course it's a completely different situation big explosion behind you ablaze now this is even better this is eddie braun eddie braun does not like heights doubling charlie sheen here and um well i mean that's crazy <laughs> jumping over over the edge this is an interesting fall uh he goes through some cabling here and then lands on a vehicle, and then there's a separate shot of him going through it into boxes in the van. They've hidden it well. This one's most definitely a wire shot. Uh, and again, I've closed this up a bit. You, the, the, the white and black reflections on the windows is, it sort of hides it, but it's a wire shot all the way down. A few more of Roy doing his thing. That's a thing called Bird of Prey. Uh, this is uh, Curse of the Pink Panther didn't want to get hit by the wheelchair so wired it so it wouldn't hit him as well on the way down this is the first fall he ever did or the first high one I saw him do locked off in the position and then locks off again for the landing that's the Turkish bath gag in uh, Escape to Athena I was lucky enough to be up on this bridge when Roy was doing some of these testings um, we did similar falls ourselves pushing away on his right foot and then moving his arms accordingly. He's, he's wanting to spot the middle of the airbag. This is quite a large airbag. This is 70 feet. And he has to just keep watching it all the way down until he gets to the point where he's happy. He's perfectly confident that when he tucks for the landing, he's going to land on his back and land right in the middle. Middle being the uh, black square in the middle of that, which he hits spot on. Lovely bit of work there. This is the one really that everybody talks about. This is the fan descender first part, and then Roy falling a hundred feet into an airbag. Again, watching his positioning, rotation of the arms, waiting, and turns over at the last minute to hit the airbag, not the truck. There you can see 
a vast array of high falls. Um, some of them are very well edited. Some of them not so well edited. Um, some of them with cabling, um, which of course um, that fall in green ice is just magnificent. I, I just it appeals. And again, you know, I was very lucky to know Roy, so I had the opportunity of being able to ask him certain questions like, "What was that like?" It looks like he's. It looks like he's falling in slow motion. I have slowed the footage down, uh, so that you know you can take a better look at it. But it looks in the original footage, like he is in slow mo when he's coming falling through the air, and his the the way that he rotates his arm, his right arm the whole time, and he's just keeping everything in place to go right now. I'm ready, and then he starts to tuck for the fall. Uh, there's a lovely story um, in point of fact because him and Vic were wanted to rehearse these falls and there aren't many places back then anyway what 1980-ish where you could go um, to rehearse a high fall so Vic had managed to secure the um, airship sheds at RAF Cardington and the two of them went off with um, Vic's airbag and up until this point Roy had done 60 or 70 feet that was as far as he'd gone and when he got up there uh, he said wow he said it's a bit um, <laughs> it's, it's very different up here and Vic said well I'll tell you what I'll do I'll go and then you you go above me on, on the um, they brought some scaffolding and he said, you go above me and you lean over the edge and you watch me go. And then when I've gone, I've hit the airbag, then you come down to my point, you know, just from a perspective point of view to, to kind of tell your brain, look, I'm up here and it's not so bad, you know. I suppose you have to keep talking to yourself the whole time. So that's what he did. Um, he was about 15 feet above Vic, lying on the top. And then Vic jumped um, and dived out. And, and uh, Roy kept saying to himself, when's he going to tuck for the landing? Surely he's got to tuck now. When's he going to tuck for the landing? I mean, it just appeared as though it was taking so long to hit the hit the airbag. And then finally he did. He said, right. And he came down and uh, on the radio. And he said, right, I'm ready. And Vic said, we can't do it. The airbag's not... There's a problem with the airbag. We can't do it. Oh, no. So the first time that he did it was on location in Mexico City. Um, and it is a remarkable fall. Vic, was, of course, was rehearsing for um, the one we saw there, which was uh, Omen 3, the final conflict. That was a viaduct of 100 feet. And... Um, and and Roy was rehearsing for the Green Ice one. It's just it's unbelievably good. I don't know what it is about it I, because it's split. You've got the you've got the um, the early part of that fall, which is the fan descender, which Vic was responsible for producing alongside Dave Bickers, which was from existing equipment. It was from parachute equipment, if you remember. And so on the top of the building, that would have let Roy go. And he's going into camera, falling towards camera, and then they cut, and then it's the high fall into the uh, the truck. It's a it's a it's a water bottle truck, but obviously they uh, they had created an airbag at the bottom. It's absolutely majestic. There's a bunch of falls on there which are really spectacular. Dar Robinson's very obviously um, the um, the one in Sharky's machine has always bothered me because you will have seen um, if not it's on here go and check it out you will have seen his tribute and there is footage of him on location in Atlanta uh, doing rehearsing and testing for that fall and he says right I'm coming out and he goes out backwards so he's on the run and he runs backwards and goes out and then there's a cut to him. Uh, you can see him coming through the air and he shouts right in the middle and he lands ba -ba boom right in the middle. Now he gets out of the bag and he says to Kai Michelson, his, uh, his stunt engineer and his team of stunt people, she's just hitting like a ton of bricks. 
Um, I there's there's too much air in that bag, and when I hit it, it's really really you know even though I'm dispersing my weight, it's really very very hard when I'm hitting it. So you know there's got to be less air in it, or it has to start deflating upon impact, which is you know something that has to be considered because if that if there's too much pressure and that's like heating water and you saw some of the falls in there into water you know um if you're not hitting it properly that'll that'll kill you and um yeah so there's there's some there's some very tricky stuff going on but on the take for that picture for Sharky's machine he's got the face mask on because he's doubling henry silver and he's not going backwards anymore he is running forwards to turn at the last minute as he hits the glass to go out. Well, when you go out backwards and turn, you will continue to rotate. You can't just stop rotating. You're going to keep going, which is why I mentioned there that when he hits that airbag, he's sideways, you know, and his knees will go bang and they will, they will impact each other as they come in. So, you know, he, he may be, he may well be wearing pads, whatever the deal is. But he's very lucky to to be able to get away with that. And maybe, maybe the again the wind situation. It was early in the morning when they filmed it. Maybe it was mid afternoon when they were doing the rehearsal. You don't know these things are taken into consideration. Um, then of course, stick, and that remarkable two hundred foot high fall with no airbag and simply a small cable rammed up his trouser leg. Um, the decelerator coming into its own. Incidentally, if you've seen the movie, um, the fall before that, it's often suggested that Dar did it, and I, I, I'm not entirely convinced, but I believe he did do it. I was under the impression Glenn Wilder had done it. He's the stunt coordinator on the picture. But uh, I believe Dar did that as well, doubling Charles Durning. Two very different shaped characters, uh, Dar and Charles Durning. So, yeah, remarkable. And at one time, I was also under the impression that's a. Um, it's not an automatic weapon, it's a revolver. And I was always under the impression you had to cock it, fire it, cock it, fire it. But I'm not sure he's doing that. Just ch counting the shots on the way down, fires all six fires all six on the way down but i don't think he has to cock it every time if he does that would be spectacular uh maybe somebody could comment on that there's always somebody out there who is an expert on firearms as long as you have a background in firearms from a military perspective or indeed your job then so be it then do comment up by all means let me know if the gun he was using which looked very much like a 357 magnum needed to be cocked and fired every time um, I know there were many replicas about later on where you could just pull the squeeze the trigger squeeze the trigger squeeze the trigger so if that's the case that's one hell of a piece of work he really has uh, uh, done an incredible job there and uh, you know that's the beauty of uh, of this the 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 idea also and the studio they weren't very happy with him getting the role he said he wanted to act he said to Bert I'd like to act. Bert went, okay. So when this movie came up, Bert said, I'll put you in for this role. And then had to convince the studio that he was capable enough to do it as well as the action. Because there'd been a number of gags leading up to this big one, which of course was going to be the last thing. And all of that dialogue had to be done first before he does the fall itself. Quite spectacular stuff. But for me, the high fall is still massively important. And uh, it still takes my breath away whenever I see uh, a fall on the big or small screen. Um, and I hope it uh, happens with you too. I hope you enjoy them too. Um, that's it for this week. And uh, I thank you again for coming back and saying hello and watching. Uh, if you've enjoyed that, go and check out some of the other stuff. If you've arrived purely by chance uh, and you've thought, what's this all about? Then why not subscribe there's plenty more where this came from there's a back catalogue of all sorts of bits and pieces which you can peruse at your leisure or leisure depending on which side of the pond you are currently on we will be back next week with more of the same uh, so until then i bid you a fond adieu